You're listening to The Real Short Box, a comic book podcast made for geeks by geeks. Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in and listening to The Real Short Box. My name is Donald. And my name is Kevin. And Kevin, we are here today um, actually to talk about uh, some collecting of key comic books in the copper age. Am I correct? That is correct. It's basically, depending on where you believe it begins, it definitely begins in the mid-1980s up to the early 1990s. So roughly maybe a nine to ten year period. Anywhere between like 1984, 1992, 1993 in that range. Okay. So we're covering like ALF could be qualified as a copper age book. You know what? Yes. Yes, it would. Huh. That's very cool. Or another one would be Thundercats, which, of course, unfortunately, at this point, for many of you out there, it is out of reach. Thundercats, Transformers, G.I. Joe, Joe, Silverhawks, all Copper Age books now. Yes. And unfortunately, no, sorry, fortunately or unfortunately, you see it. There's a lot of speculating in, in these properties and some of them are being brought to the movie screen or the animated uh-huh. Uh, TV shows, one on He-Man's, another one, of course, which we know is already out there on Netflix. Yeah, don't uh, you find it amazing, though, like, for example, how Transformers, how the first appearance of the Transformers in comic book form stayed so cheap for so long after all of these movies and all of these comic book or cartoon properties? I never understood that. I, like, I remember when the first live-action movie came out back in 2007, I was, I think you might remember, I was making sure I was picking up a bunch of those books and nothing really happened. It was yeah. really bizarre. Yeah, all these sequels come out and like no one seemed to care. So I figured, oh, OK, it's all good. I care, but other folks didn't seem to care. But now all nope. of a sudden things have changed. Now people are killing themselves to get their hands on these books. It's the sentimentality of people that are near our age that grew up with these things. They grew up with He-Man. They grew up with Thundercats, Silverhawks, Transformers, uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. They grew up with all of these properties and now there's this huge sentimentality of I would like to own the first appearance of these characters and, and especially trying, trying to and do that. And especially if they have disposable income. Now it's, you know, it's kind of like well, hey, that's all, when you were a kid, you said to yourself, you know, what, one day when I'm like, when I grow up, I'm going to buy whatever. So now people are in this position, especially those who, uh, gentlemen and, and ladies and gentlemen out there that are have good incomes and high incomes. They can now get whatever they want. Hey, I'm going to pick up that issue. I'm going to pick up that particular figure I couldn't afford when I was a kid, whatever the case may be. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's it's really fascinating. There's a, there's a lot of that. I saw uh, somebody drop uh, a couple hundred dollars on a, on a toy, on a Transformer oh, yeah. action figure that was still mint in, in card, so to speak, or mint in, mint in box. Oh, uh, yeah. That, that, you know, that they just wanted. And, and it wasn't even like a, an Optimus Prime or anything. I think it was like Rodimus Prime. You know, oh, yeah. bullshit one from the movie that I was like, this guy's bullshit. And <laughs> true enough, he was bullshit. I, I never liked him. I still don't like him. I you always thought, that, who was that guy kinda... in between? Uh, between Optimus oh, and Optimus. Ultra Magnus. Ultra Magnus. Yes. Ultra Magnus was kick ass. I actually was... agree with you. Rodimus uh, was kind of, yeah, so so. Right. And who did the voice of Ultra Magnus? It was uh, it was Robert Stack, right? In the movie, in the movie, yes. Yeah, yeah, movie. yeah, yeah. From uh, from uh, Unsolved, Unsolved Mysteries. Mysteries, and also yeah. the uh, Untouchables. Yeah. It's, uh, it's and, and, and also Airplane. Uh yes, it was also Airplane. Yeah, he was pretty funny in that. But anyway, let's get started on this so we can get some people some some ideas in some of these books. Um, and, help, and help them if they want to speculate, maybe make a little bit of money over the next yeah. year or two. Yeah, I want to bring up one right away because I feel it's very, very important. So if you just listen to this part, you'll be like, OK, cool. These people know what they're doing. Uh, this is a great book. You can Go still find this one super cheap in comic shops, a lot of comic shops. Uh, in back issue bins, you can find it at yard sales. Uh, dollar bins all over the U.S. It is All Star Squadron number twenty five. Now this one came out in the eighties. Uh, this one, interestingly enough, has a lot of first appearances. It's the first appearance of Infinity Inc. Which oh is yes, a DC Comics team. Um, the Infinity Comic uh, inf- or Infinity Inc. Uh, comic book uh, came after. It has in this comic All Star Squadron number twenty five the first appearance of. Uh, Nuclon, 
the first appearance of Northwind, uh, Jade, uh, the first appearance of the Silver Scarab, I believe Brainwave Jr., uh, and Obsidian as well, Jade and Obsidian being brother and sister uh, from Alan Scott, the original Green Lantern. Uh, interestingly enough, they're his uh, children. Uh, so really just some awesomely cool characters. Uh, I believe Fury is also in here as well, first appearance of Fury. Um, so something that that I think that you can, you can get your hands on up till like a few months ago, maybe four to eight months, I'd say somewhere around that, that realm, you could grab this book for one or $2. And like I said, some, you can still get lucky and find it probably for that, maybe 10 bucks somewhere. Uh, but I did notice that people started to take notice of this book. And now I'm looking on eBay in a nine. Oh, somebody on here is asking $75 for it plus $20 for shipping. So it's like, Almost a hundred dollar book at this point, graded at a nine O, which is not like super. But the thing is, is that this book's going to be hard to find in a night eight now because it was relegated to the dollar bins for so long in the quarter boxes. That's what happens that's, with these types of books. That's so true. you have to look, and any time you find a book that you know shows these teams and now presenting or whatever like that, look it up. Say, okay, I'm curious. Is this the first appearance of this team? Uh, of uh, And if it is, is it also the first appearance of these characters that are in this team? Because that happens a lot. And you can get some really stellar books and some really good keys uh, for cheap by doing it that way. And this All-Star Squadron number 25 is one of those. Absolutely. I agree with you 100%. And you never know. They might, might use some of these characters for an HBO Max uh, television show over the next couple of years. You never know what's, what's, what's going to be announced. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, they, they could. HBO Max is a big one because it's DC properties and they're starting to move forward on a lot of them. Um, and hopefully we're going to get some some uh, no offense to the CW. We're going to get some higher quality uh, writing and higher quality work. And what I mean by that is we don't need 23 to 20 you know episodes of a season of this stuff. Cut it in half. Give us 10 episodes. And just make it really good, you know. Very solid. Just make it solid. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Make it like a mini series. Make it really good and and really stellar and and you know just hold our attention. And I think that you're going to see more of this happening if it takes off and it does well. So which I think it will because HBO Max has been knocking it out of the park lately with a lot of properties and a lot of shows that they've been putting out. It's actually very. They're doing. They're very surprising at how well they're doing already. Uh, competing with uh, Disney Plus, uh, Netflix, Amazon Prime, and the and the others, you know, they're doing extremely well, actually. And that's the key, you know. A few people a few years ago predicted this was going to happen. That streaming was going to be a big thing. They even had articles in the trades, the movie, the movie TV trades, talking about streamline wars or streaming wars, I should say. And mm -hmm. yeah, especially during the COVID pandemic, it has certainly heated up with movie yep. theaters being closed up until recently. Yep. And, and since we're in the DC realm, let's talk about Crisis on Infinite Earths. Okay. Well, I believe, and we were talking about this earlier before we started recording, there are three issues I believe people should go after, and they're very affordable. They're probably no more than $10 in the worst case scenario. You could probably get it for like four or five bucks, these particular issues. Uh -huh. So let's start, let's start with the very first issue of Crisis on Infinite Earths. You have the very first appearance of Blue Beetle Ted Cord in the DC Universe after being acquired or after Charlton Comics being acquired by DC Comics. Yeah. So I know this that's is something that's very special, special to your heart, especially, but yep. also, and, also, also mine. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows. And if you don't, uh, I created a web series called the Blue Beetle Ted Cord Returns. It's on Rumble Stream. Spoon Productions uh, YouTube page. You can watch it there or on RumbleSpoon.com, the website, where you can watch the Blue Beetle web series as well. It is available. It's a lot of fun. It's uh, for all ages, but it's still a lot of fun. It's very good, I think, anyway. Maybe I'm a little partial to it, a little biased, but whatever. Just check it out. Four, uh, but, yeah. four seasons of power-packed action. Yes, there you go. Um, I wanted to say, though, that Captain Adam 83 from the Charlton universe was the first appearance of Ted Cord as the Blue Beetle. He was created by Steve Ditko. Uh, basically, he was to combine Spider-Man with Batman. Uh, and that's kind of what you got was the Blue Beetle of Ted Cord. 
uh, he did pretty well for Charlton, but uh, then, uh, of course, they went out of business and DC acquired the rights. Right now, that Captain Adam 83 is pretty expensive. You know, it's a four or $500 book in good shape. So what I recommend is just what you said. Get the uh, Crisis on Infinite Earths issue one. It's his first appearance in the DC universe, which is important. That's a very uh, seminal issue. That issue actually in really good shape probably goes for about $20 now um, in most shops. But again, you are right. You can find it for probably 5 to 10 in some comic shops that just aren't paying attention. Yard sales, flea markets, things like that. So just keep your eyes peeled for Crisis on Infinite Earths number one. Now, I know we had a couple other issues that you were going to say. Yes. And also, real quick, there's also four other appearances in that book. The Monitor, Al- Alexander Luther Jr., and, and Pariah. Just let oh, people yeah. know. Those guys, too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The next one I'm going to mention is Crisis on Infinite Earths number four. And this is very important because I forgot about this. You have the second appearance of John Constantine in this book. Yeah, that's actually a very important thing to note because I can guarantee you that is an under the radar book. Not a lot of people know about this. Uh, Mm -hmm. John Constantine first appeared in a swamp thing, uh, comic book. Uh, and, um, that was, uh, that was big. And it, it, it's always been like a, a 20 to $30 book for like the longest time, even after his TV series that came out, even after him being in legends of tomorrow, uh, you know, all this Keanu, stuff uh, Keanu even after the Reeves movie, movie with Keanu Reeves. Yeah, all this stuff until most recently. Now it's a four or five hundred dollar book easily. In, wow. In really good condition. You can even wow. probably push it to about six or seven. So, wow. Kind of crazy how much that first appearance is worth. And now that everybody's getting priced out of thir- first appearances, what are they looking at? Second. Second appearances. Right. So this book is big for that reason alone. So heed our warning, folks. Get this book while you still can. And right now, again, it could be in the single digits to as high as maybe fifteen, twenty dollars at, at worst. So if yep. I were you, now now is the time to grab this book. Matter of fact, you want to be a little greedy, grab three. Yeah. 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 Yep. And also uh, you you have the first appearance of Lord Volt, Lady Quark, and Dr. Light Kimio Hoshi. Yeah, which is actually she's a really cool character. Um, the original Dr. Light was a bastard. Uh, talk <laughs> about a true piece of shit rapist. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, not a good man. Uh, so she kind of took the name to, uh, I guess, make it make it good. Dr. Light, as in positive, you know, positive light. Uh, painting that on the, on the scene, so to speak. So, uh, yeah, really cool character, too. She had a big influence in, uh, in the Justice League run in the 80s as well. Uh, Justice League International, Justice League Europe. She was all over that. Absolutely. And, you know, again, this is a character that could be used in an HBO Max TV show. You never know. So definitely want to get this issue, not just for John Constantine's second appearance, but for these other characters that could be used at some point in time. Yeah. What's another one, Kevin? Another one would be Crisis on Infinite Earths, number six. And this is the first DC appearance of more Charlton characters. Captain Adam, Judo Master, Nightshade, Peacemaker, the question and thunderbolt that is huge particularly just for peacemaker because peacemaker is so hard to find um i don't know why i know his first appearance is incredibly hard to find it's a fighting five comic which no one read apparently uh and if they did they immediately burned it after reading it um because there was only like one copy ever on ebay and somebody already wanted four or five hundred dollars for it before any announcement of the peacemaker being in anything you know tv or in movies again um or john cena's attachment none of that so right now his first appearance in the dc universe this is huge guys i can't i can't talk about this enough how big this is so you definitely want to pick up that book if you're smart go get it you mm-hmm. know it's probably it's nowhere anywhere between you know six to ten dollars actually six to ten maybe fifteen dollars at most yeah. Get it now. And also first cover and full appearance of the Anti-Monitor, as yep. well as the first appearance of Yolanda Montez as Wildcat. Yeah, Yolanda uh, being in the Stargirl TV series, making an appearance in that. Um, that's a good one to have. Uh, the Anti-Monitor, a.k.a. Mobius, alone is a is a really great uh, 
character. Uh, the name, it's funny because I was watching the Crisis on Infinite Earths miniseries on the WB. And every time they say the anti-monitor, it's just such a dumb name to hear out loud. It's fine right. on the printed page and it doesn't bother you. But when you hear it out loud, you're like, wow, they really did not like come up with a great name for this guy. Like Mobius would have been better to just leave it at that, you know, like use his alter ego name. But that's true. The, anti the, 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 the anti-monitor does like doesn't still fear in you, does it? <laughs> not at all. It's like uh, in the Supergirl series, they were doing uh, Cyborg Superman, which is great. He's such a cool looking character. And I love, love, love him as a character. Hank Henshaw is awesome. But I think they might have just they should have just called him Hank Henshaw uh, or Dr. Henshaw or something like that. You know, Captain Henshaw. I don't know anything else. But the cyborg Superman, because hearing that out loud when they had him in Supergirl, I am the cyborg Superman. So stupid. It sounded I laughed out loud. It sounded so dumb. <laughs> so if they, if, I'm, uh, if I'm, I'm they decide right to too. take some of these properties and move them forward into film, not just television, I think a rename could be in order. And I would not blame anybody for doing that, especially with those two characters. That's true. You know, you, you can probably think of another name. Maybe call him Superman. Well, you know what's funny? Yeah, Superman Prime, which sounds cool. That doesn't sound so bad. No. That's true. When you hear Cyber, Cyber, Cyborg Superman, it does sound kind of weird. Yeah, yeah. You, just have to, you have to find like another name from. I think maybe even, take the, was, even uh, you know, Superman Prime or whatever, I think calling him, you know, Prime, you know, would have been fine. You know, we have versions of Superman here, alternate versions. We have Cyborg. We have Prime. We have, you know, that could be the Eradicator. You know, Eradicator sounds cool. We've got all of those, you know, S Steel, you know, mm -hmm. all of those would sound cool if they did it that way. But, you know, maybe, maybe like Cyborg X. <laughs> something. I don't know. But I digress. Let's let's move on. Uh, we talked about the DC kind of uh, miniseries that define the 80s. Now let's talk about the Marvel uh, miniseries that define the 80s, and that would be Secret Wars. That is correct. Secret Wars, which came out a year before the uh, Infinite Crisis, excuse me, Crisis on Infinite Earths. And as we know, this is the issue one is the first appearance of the Beyonder. Yes, and it is not Beyonder your reach. Ha <laughs> ha, Zinc. Well, that's bad, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, that one can, is pretty obtainable, I think, as well, right? Yeah, it's not too bad. It, it is going up in value. It'd be anywhere between 20 to maybe as high as $40, depending on the condition. Yeah, still an obtainable book, though. We're not talking in the, you know, the triple digits, the $100 range. Uh, we're still talking about in the, you know, in the, in the $30 to $50 range uh, for a high grade, which is great. Uh, let's talk about the issue numbers that are of note for this series. Well, besides, besides number one. Besides number one, the next one we should discuss is issue three. This is the first appearance of the second Titania. And as we know, Titania is speculated to be a part of the She-Hulk uh, TV series on oh, Disney+. Titania? Plus. I'm sorry, Titania, I'm not saying it right. Titania, thank you. Yeah, no problem. I was like, who's Titania? Yeah, Titania. <laughs> Titania. Um, very cool character. And uh, yeah, she's going to be the big baddie or one of the big baddies for She-Hulk, uh, supposedly. Uh, so that's a that's a big one to get. What's that one going for right now? Anywhere between, I see as low as twenty five to as high as fifty five dollars. So it's it's oh, up there. So I saw so I just say a high grade one is definitely going to cost you more now. Yeah. So we're looking thirty to sixty probably within that range. Yeah. Still affordable, and there has been mums the word on the She Hulk except for whispers of Titania. So I think now's the best time uh, to grab that. So you have this advantage right now. We're telling you. Uh, guys, we've been doing this for a long time, and I'm not trying to toot our horn or pat ourselves on the back or anything. It's just if you go back and you listen to some of our uh, speculative podcasts, we've done pretty well as far as like letting you know to try to get ahead of the curve what books to pick up and how much affordable they were at the time. Most of them are not any longer. So get these while you can. Uh, you know, if, if ever you listen to us, now would be the time to do so, because these are books that are just going to go up and up and up. Uh, Especially what, since we're talking about Marvel books, you know, Marvel's hot. So Disney yeah. Plus, every time they announce a new show or a new character or a second season of a show, you know, yes. someone someone's coming. 
Yep, Marvel is great for that. Uh, issue six, am I correct? Is it issue six or issue seven? Uh, we get the first appearance of a brand new uh, Spider Spider Woman. Uh, it's actually both. Number six is the cameo appearance of Julia Carpenter as okay. the second Spider Woman. And the seventh issue is the first full appearance. Yeah. Yeah. And seventh, also, the I add, half on the cover, I believe it's a pink cover. It's really cool. Yes. Look. And also, if I might add, it's the first battle between She Hulk and Titania. Ah, great. Titania and She Hulk fighting it out. And the first Spider Woman, uh, the new Spider Woman, uh, Carpenter. That's that's great. Carpenter's her costume was great too. That black and white kind of look yeah, to it. It's it's pretty cool. It kind of kind yes. of a little similar to Spider Man's black and white costume. Yeah, and it kind of revitalized the character too. Uh, it, it brought some relevance back to her, and she had her own series for like a half a minute. Uh, she was part of the, I believe she was part of the Avengers. She was definitely a part of the uh, the nineties Defenders um, with, I think it was Wolverine. Uh, Dark Hawk. Uh, she was on Dark the West Coast Avengers, if I can recall. In Ghost Rider, what's that? I believe she was on the West Coast Avengers. Yeah, she was also on the West Coast Avengers, but she was part of the Defenders as well. Oh uh, yes, they, absolutely. Yeah, she, she, she de- definitely got around. Yeah, <laughs> well, uh, in a good in a good way. Within hero groups, yeah, heroic teams and stuff. Uh, we're not saying she's, you know, uh, a lady of uh, of loose morals, so to speak, but. Uh, you know, I, I digress. Let's 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 move on. <laughs> what's <laughs> what's the next one that we have? Um, I would go with number eight. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, number eight's out of your range. If it's not good for you, uh, that's the first one of the first argued uh, black costume Spider-Man's, uh, you know, and if you're into that sort of thing, cool. Grab it. If you're not, don't worry about it. It's It's already kind of expensive. Move on to something else. And that something else could be. Another comic book like Avengers 257, the first appearance of Nebula. Yeah, Nebula from Guardians of the Galaxy. She's and actually really cool, and we're going to see her in the third one. I'm sure of it. Yes, in 2023, we'll see her again. And you know what? She was pretty interesting character in uh, Endgame. You know, she went through certain things. That, if you haven't seen the movie, it was pretty cool. It was sort of part of her character arc. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of fun. A lot of fun with the character. Uh, really enjoyed uh, the performance of the character in the films. I'm excited to see her back, and I'm excited to see where they can take this character. And hopefully, I don't, I, you know, the, that kind, that book there, I think, will dip. It will go back down, and it'll go back up. It'll go back down and go back up. Speculation right now. Get it now because it's back down. Grab it now. What's it going for right now, Kevin, roughly? Uh, roughly in that $25 to $50 range, you know, depending on yeah. condition. So speculatively speaking, it's a good time to get it uh, because they haven't they haven't really announced the everybody that's in the third film of Guardians. Uh, they haven't announced uh, Avengers 5 yet, although they are uh, speculatively working on it right now. I'm doing air quotes. You guys can't see, but I am. Uh, and uh, a lot of other things that are kind of uh, in the works. So there's room for this character to grow. So it's a good time to grab this book. And even if it just only, you know, kind of bumps up 25, 30 bucks, hey, you know, you made 20, 30 dollars out of it. You know, you can't go wrong with that. Uh, wait a couple of years just sit on the book for a while. Uh, it's not something that's going to be a quick flip. It's uh, kind of a you're playing a long game with this one. Uh, but, Absolutely. Uh, we do have some other books here real quickly. Um, w- name a couple other ones here, Kevin. Uh, I would say Thor 338, the second appearance of Beta Ray Bill. It's, it's still pretty affordable. I wouldn't mind grabbing that. Plus, it's a pretty cool cover. You got Thor and Beta Ray Bill fighting over, um, and I can never say that the darn hammer right, but Majinor, Majinor, how you say it? Majinor? M- M- yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I can never pronounce it right. Yeah, it's kind of one of those things where uh, you have to be able to speak cat in order to say it correctly. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Uh, but uh, yeah, that, that Thor cover's great. What's that one going for, roughly? Probably in that same range, 30 to 50? Uh, you know, I haven't seen ones going for 50, but I would say at most, maybe 30 to 40. Hey, okay. So that means that there's a chance that you could find one for 20 bucks at a shop. Absolutely. Yeah, so that's a good one to get. Second appearance of Beta Ray Bill. We know he's coming. We just don't know exactly when, but we know he's coming. So this is going to be a great book to have. His first appearance obviously is a little bit out of range right now, 
uh, anywhere from two probably to about five hundred dollars, depending on the grade. If you get a perfect grade, a nine eight yeah, or C- above. Yeah, CGC, exactly. Yeah, it's going to go a little bit high, maybe 350 even. I'm being a little bit uh, outlandish maybe with the pricing, but it's just high. It's priced high. Uh, so if you can get the second appearance for pretty cheap, like 20 bucks, do it. There's nothing wrong with that. That is a good speculation book. And speaking of good speculation books, throw out another one, Kevin. Okay, how about – actually, no, I won't go with that, that one. Let's go with – the saga swap thing number 25 first cameo appearance of john constantine or when his book came out back in the 80s hellblazer now we were just arguing about this uh cameo thing somebody in a in a comic book group that i'm a part of on facebook was arguing he said you know no matter what they tell you the first appearance is the cameo appearance that's the first appearance of the character no matter what if first full uh, brief, whatever he said that the cameo is always going to be the first. You know why he's saying that? Re- he you know why he's saying that? that? You know why he's saying that? I, I, I bet a million dollars he doesn't have a Hulk 181, but he has a Hulk 180. Probably. In into which I responded so uh, coyly and slyly. I, I I put a little sly smile in there. I said, "Well, let's talk about Superboy number zero, because Superboy number zero is the first so to speak, cameo of King Shark. And the cameo of King Shark is ridiculous. All it is is a smiling set of teeth. Shark teeth <laughs> in, in like a prison room that, that they've just broken out of. That's all you see. And that's classified as the first cameo of King Shark. But you don't see any more than teeth. That, to me, is bullshit. And that, <laughs> of, of course, that's why it's a cameo. So... That idea of a cameo being the first appearance, no matter what, that doesn't jive with me. So I argued against that. So, yeah, this book here, this uh, Saga of Swamp thing, what issue was it, Kevin? Uh, 25. 25. This issue 25 being the cameo of John Constantine. Um, I don't know. I, I, I've never looked inside this book, to be honest. I'm going to be completely honest. I don't know how brief it is of his cameo if we just see his shoes or a cigarette on the ground or something or a shadow we get, marvel is funny i don't so so i can't say for dc but marvel is funny in that they love to do shadow cameos a yeah, shadowy character in the corner or out of off you know off camera or whatever off panel uh pops up and you see just a tidbit of the shadow you just see a smile or the the face or you know <laughs> They love that. Marvel has loved shadow cameos for as long as I can remember. DC, uh, it, not it as much. But when DC butchers things with cameos, it's just smiling teeth. Yeah, it is really strange. Yeah. Um, anything else you want to throw out before we wrap this up? Uh, I would say X Factor number five, first cameo appearance of Apocalypse. So I'm sure your friend would say that's the first appearance of Apocalypse. <laughs> I think, issue, yeah, you're right. I think issue six, honestly, his being it's, his first full. It, yeah, is he enough? Six is he enough? So I'm, that's why I'm not really mentioning it because now, not to say it's out of range or anything like that, but it, it's not right. cheap anymore. Put it that way. It's not cheap, but I think you can still get it for just under a Benji, just under a hundred bucks. I think you yeah. can get a decent copy of X Factor number six. Uh, so that would be worth it, I feel, because Apocalypse is a character much like Magneto. He has a story a good background story he's not a true villain in a lot of ways but his actions are villainous so there, there's a lot that that we see with uh what is it ab sabanor or... oh uh and sabakanor and yeah. something like that and, Sab- and sabahanor and sabahanor yeah. something like that <laughs> yeah something like that there's a lot more to that character than just uh being a, a flash in a pan villain just to be a villain he has a, a, a mythology, a, a, a methodology, so to speak, behind him. So I understand why he has such staying power. So we'll see him again at some point. And I honestly can't wait until that happens. Yeah, especially now that the uh, these uh, MCM movies, I like to call them now, you know, multi yeah. Marvel Cinematic Multiverse. It's going to bring yeah. all these characters up to, to the forefront. Funny to me how uh, a lot of X Men villains could be villains for the entire Marvel universe. They're just so powerful and so oh, well done. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, 
So look for that. Uh, X Factor 5 also, if you don't want to spend the money on 6, that's his first cameo of, of Apocalypse. Pick that up. It's pretty reasonable. It's a rather cheap book, actually. You can still get that. Uh, and I got, and I, $15, and $20 I, range. And I got one more for you. Uh, Uncanny X-Men 201. That's the first appearance of Nathan Summers, or known as Baby Cable. Baby Cable. Yay. Yeah, so get yourself some baby cable before he's full grown cable. So um, your friend again, one. your friend again would probably argue that this is the first true appearance of cable. And I guess in this yeah. case, you could make the argument that this is the first true appearance of cable. I mean, if we're talking about uh DNA wise, yeah. I mean, but also that uh that little bit of uh black uh blubber or whatever that's uh that's in the prison or wherever is is also the first venom, so to speak. So <laughs> you know, there's there's so many different things that you can argue about with that. So I, I think he's totally wrong. He's just, uh, again, like you said so coyly, uh, it's probably because he has a lot of cameos and not a lot of true first appearances. So he's just trying to push that uh, agenda, so to speak. He's probably written letters to uh, Key Collector and uh, and that other guys who, sh- uh, who shall not be named because uh, I refuse to um, that uh, shills for uh, for them. But uh, <laughs> anyway, one day, uh, one day you guys gotta be friends. No, never. Um, I d- a doubtful unless unless uh, he uh, he can. Uh, I don't know. Like if he can control time, then yeah, probably I'd want to be his friend. Uh, but otherwise, no. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I think that's gonna wrap us up for the uh, for this podcast. Thank you guys for listening in. We're probably gonna do another one of these uh, for this. Uh, copper era um, because there is still a lot to mine from this era this just like eight to oh, ten yes. year uh, period in comic books a very reasonably in in sometimes ultra cheap first appearances that you can grab up uh so thank you all for listening uh thank you for being a part of this kevin uh we are on a multitude of platforms uh name some uh spreaker uh, blueberry uh google uh apple Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, good Lord, there's so many of them. Be right. Amazon, iHeartRadio, iHeartRadio. Uh, you know, tune in. There's, there's just so many that you can find us on. If you can't find us on one that you love, let us know. And we'll get, a, we'll find a way to get on it. No problem. Uh, we are also on Rumble Sprint Productions YouTube page. Uh, every Monday or almost every Monday, we do live podcasts. Uh, we do a lot of fun things like top tens and then you vote type things where you as an audience member can come in the chats and vote for your favorite comic book characters or films or whatever like that. We do just a lot of multitude of fun things and we have some giveaways every once in a while. So tune into that and uh, also uh, maybe tune into your local comic shop uh, and uh, – you know, let them know that the real short box sent you, um, because uh, it's great that you can support and that you do support your local comic shops as well. Uh, one more thing that I just want to quickly mention our sponsors. Uh, if you get a chance, uh, please check out uh, splatteredfrog.com. Uh, use 20% off coupon code Donald Hiccups. You get 20% off on your order. Uh, we do have a hot sauce uh, sponsor. It's Half's Hot Sauce. Uh, that's actually, I'm so sorry. The Half's Hot Sauce coupon code is Donald Hiccups. For Splattered Frog, it is Shortbox. So you get uh, 20% off if you use Shortbox for Splattered Frog. And for uh, the Half's Hot Sauce, you use Donald Hiccups for 10% off on your order. There. I got everything straightened. Sorry about that. Uh, and and thank you for again for being on and for listening to The Real Shortbox. Again, my name is Donald. And my name is Kevin. And we will see you at the Charming cheerful but always clean comic book shop this has been the real short box we'll see you at the comic shop thanks for listening